don't feel your feelings. Feelings are for put. That's the Andrew Tate movement. So let me ask you, what are your thoughts on someone with an approach more like a Jordan Peterson? How many sound bites and like Instagram clips are there of Jordan Peterson crying? <laughs> more than you can count. That's what I'm talking about. You can be both. If you're a man and you want to be a warrior, be a warrior. I don't disagree with everything that Andrew Tate is saying. I just think it's wrapped in toxicity. But Jordan Peterson is a lot more nuanced because Jordan Peterson says, yeah, be a man and you can also cry. You can also grieve. Hello and welcome to the Vinny Brusco Show podcast. I have a question for you. What is your relationship with your soul? Also, what is your experience with psychedelics? That's where this month's guest, Dr. Ido Cohen, comes into play. Dr. Cohen is a depth psychologist, but he's also a psychedelic integration psychologist. Dr. Cohen and I had some deep conversation about the golden thread, Jungian psychology, masculinity and how it shows up in the world, and a cornucopia of other things. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Ido Cohen. Welcome to the Vinny Brasco Show. You're listening to the amazing podcast. And here we go. I heard you on uh, the Third Eye uh, Drops podcast, and um, you have you have the the combination of things that I find to be probably the most intoxicating and the most connected to, which is the world of spirituality and psychology, and. In the culture that of, of psychology, we're seeing a big shift towards a more spiritual connection with it, rather than a little bit more of the old mindset of psychology. Yeah. What would what would you attribute that that shift to? Well, first, thank you for having me. I I listened to some of your podcasts. I actually just saw your latest uh, release, and I'm curious to listen to it. And um, why would I treat? Oh, wow, we are many things. I think it's actually interesting what's happening now in the world of psychology, as I understand it, is there's two, there's two streams happening at the same time. On the one hand, there is a push from the board of psychology that uh, I always imagined them as like this fake round table, you know, and Anyway, um, to be more evidence-based, so like what's working, let's, is it quantified, can we research it, can we applicable, um, applied in short time, short treatments. And then there's what you're saying, which is actually going towards a more psycho-spiritual approach to the human condition, because we are understanding that there is no other approach to the human condition. We have such deep systemic issues that they don't have quick quick resolutions right uh, i think if anything covid really exposed all of us <laughs> all of us individually all of us collectively that we are we are really lacking um you know i was trying to find numbers i don't know why but i felt like i should find look at the numbers but i remember at some point reading in covid how there was an increase of just in the United States of 40% in addiction, 35% in depression, 35% in anxiety. In Japan, there was an increase of 80% in suicide cases. Wow. Those are for people who don't understand what that means. 40% increase in addiction is about 10 to 15 million people. And a lot of it, yes, obviously COVID was a big thing, but a lot of it is, I think, um, all of us kind of being at home and seeing really kind of taking a really deep look into what is the quality of my inner life? What is the quality of my outer life? And that we are disconnected from purpose, from meaning, from whatever people call spirituality. Everybody has a different definition of what's spiritual to them. So I think there were the, there is a stream of psychology that's definitely going in that direction. And I think a big part of it is the psychedelic renaissance, right? That's laying on top of that. That's really going, starting already to challenge big pharma and, and the psychological approaches of now, which is, well, no, we have these new old 
ancient actually <laughs> yeah <laughs> ancient, ancient ancient tools and ancient rituals and ancient processes that we can do that we're trying to reincorporate after the trauma of the 60s in a much more educated way and you can't do that without having a full integrative integral psycho spiritual approach to being a human so i think we're we're on the we're we're still on the precipice we haven't fully launched but we're getting closer to the edge of that precipice where things are going to change dramatically in my mind i want to go back to what you mentioned in regards to covid and how that kind of put a magnifying glass on a lot of individuals and one one picture I have in the studio here is of Dr. Manhattan from The Watchmen and when he's on when he's on mm. Mars. And I have a quote uh, by Basil Pascal, which is all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And I th- it's one of my favorite all time quotes. And that. and what COVID did was put that magnifying glass of sitting in a room alone. And I'm a that. huge proponent of sensory deprivation tanks. It's. I've I've experienced things that I hope we can get into in this podcast, but I hope. Uh, but the COVID aspect of things certainly did put uh, that magnifying glass on the individual self, and you you kind of spoke on it and touched on it. The lacking that we have as a culture and really within as an individual, what do you attribute some of that lacking to, and and what would you label that lacking of? First, I love that quote. Thank you for sharing that. And I've, you know, the way I talked about it with the people I've, I work with during COVID is that we're all in a forced meditation retreat. You want to, you're not want to. In those two first two years, everybody was in a forced meditation retreat. Even if you had kids and if you're married or you live, everybody had to really be in themselves. What do I treat with that too? Oh, wow. So many things. I mean, Okay, so I I will will use something. So I'm one of my main philosophies that I use is Jung, right? So Carl Jung, for those who are listening and are into into psychology, right? Very, very big proponent, like one of the fathers of psychology in some way. And definitely the pioneer in the world of transpersonal psychology, the psycho-spiritual approach to psychology. And he talks about how... um, the industrial, the industrialization of society made humans do a few things. One of them is disconnect from the concept of spirit. Because now there is all these demands on from society on us to produce. You have to produce work. You have to produce function. You have to be a productive member of society but within very strict and rigid rules, right? Not a society that says, hey, be who you are and then find your way back to society. It's like, no, society that says, here is who you can be. And with this very limited range, find your way back to us so we can see how you fit in. So I think a lot of it has been the, what I would call the shadow side of industrialization. You know, I don't know how deep we want to get into this, but that means that we banish from ourselves. Let's go. All the, let's go. <laughs> Let, okay, let's dive. I'm in. Um, right? We had to basically s- split apart from those creative, spiritual, um, some would say even our more um, wild aspect of ourselves, both men and women. Sure. So, so essentially society norms, expectations, and you can call it the industrialization of society has caused us to change the relationship we have with essentially our, our essence or our soul. Absolutely. Now add to that two world wars and all the devastation and pain that that brought, add to that the great depression, add to that all these calamities on a collective level. We are. We were in a century of like we have to rebuild. There's no time to feel feelings. Mm. There's no time to like right. That belongs to the artist. It belongs to the poets. It belongs to the the shamans, and it belongs to the crazy people. They get to do that. All of us have to function. We have to rebuild all this all this the society that got demolished by all these horrendous events, right? So all that all those aspects of us got. Re- 
pushed away to very specific subcultures. And now we've been in the, since the 60s, I think, at least in the US, have been slowly trying to reclaim them. Right, the sixties was such a huge revolution because they were like, "Hey, here is all these parts of you, right? All these gurus came from from Asia, from all over, and be like, hey, here's again your spirituality that you lost, but you don't have it, so we'll give you our version of it, so you can find it back again in yourselves." Well, it was it was it was taking the message and make it palatable for the common folk, right? And, and delivering it in a way that people can identify and relate and connect to that exactly. wasn't so polarizing and so woo woo, but really was this, this beautiful bridge to the unknown and, and to really mm -hmm. to ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And you, you hear like Terrence McKenna, you hear any of the great thinkers of that time and they all kind of reverberate back to the idea of the self and really the Jungian psychology, the idea of the shadow self versus the self that we have out in the light, if you want to put Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right. And that's just another, a, a more spiritual version of, of, uh, of the, the ego and the super ego. Right. So it's just another amalgamation of that. Well, it's, it's a little, it's a little different. I mean, that's where Jung and Freud got separated. Because right. Jung really believed in in this, like you're saying, the spiritual self. So for him, there's two types of self. There is the small S self and the capital S self. Small S self is what we call ego, pretty much. It's right. like a, the conscious, our conscious self that walks around in the world. Big S self is what he called the God with, within and without. So whatever you term, whatever people consider as God, divine, creator, whatever spiritual force is there, Jung is like, you have a direct link with that force and you're constantly in communication. Now we, right, like we said, there was a cut in that connection. And Jung is suggesting, is offering Jung transpersonal psychology. There's a lot of psychologies that offer a map back. How do you incorporate it back? Right? How do we recreate this connection of with and it doesn't have to be just spirit it can also be creativity it can also be you know people who were ceos and then go oh i'll share this there is a i don't remember the, his name but there's a very he's pretty popular i think he has one of the biggest media companies in london in england and there's i watched this documentary about him and he goes and he um Dennis McKenna's brother mm -hmm. um, offers him to go on a this very special ayahuasca retreat, and they go to they go to I think it's Costa Rica or something to this very bougie kind of a, a retreat center, <laughs> very posh bougie retreat yeah, exactly, center. You're exactly. not going this in is, the woods no, with no, the shamans is, and, and the panthers. No, they bring the shamans to you. You have a, like a beautiful <laughs> right. bungalow and yeah, yeah, yeah. how I would and, do it. <laughs> and the first night he sits there and all he sees is like the destruction so what we're talking about how we're destroying the earth and he goes you see him goes to the shaman between the first night and the second night. it's like hey you know i already seen this can we can i get the strong ayahuasca so you can hear the themes here right the strong i want the strong thing and the shaman is like are you sure about this he's like yeah, yeah i'm sure you see him being interviewed the second night. You know what his whole experience was about? What a shitty father he is. How he's disconnected from his children. How he's disconnected from his family. How he's not feeling his feelings. Right? So all these things that we have to push away to be... And I'm not anti-capitalism at all. But the shadow of capitalism demands that we cut off all these things in ourselves to succeed. And here he is, this super successful man, going and in the jungle and doing this thing, drinking the super strong ayahuasca, and where he comes back to himself, to seeing what's the, to coming back to in, to integrating connection, to integrating the feeling function, to integrate all these things. All right. So I think that's where we're starting. We're like have been working to continuously kind of integrate all these things, is to bring back. 
our feelings, to bring back our body, right? Our being in a connection with, in a healthy connection with our bodies, to being embodied, which I learned something really cool the other day that actually being embodied is about bringing your spirit, all that you are, into your physical body. It's not just about being in your body. Mm. I mm. like that. That's good. I like I like that too. I was like, oh, now that word makes so much sense. To me. Yeah, the embodiment of all of you, not just um, in the physical realm, but in this mind, body, synergy, harmonistic energy frequency that's just and, bottled up in a vessel. Exactly. And then your body becomes the vessel that's supposed to express the totality of who you are. Love that. That's that's such a uh, a a great way to put it because, again, you can go into the woo woo of things, and but there is this connective tissue, this golden thread that yeah. that is interwoven between all of us, and and some of us, you know, we you just can't put your finger on it, but there is something there, and and you know, mm -hmm. no matter who you are, or what you are, or any walk of life, you experience it at some degree in some level and just to go back to what you were saying a little bit earlier with the idea of you know it all circles back to yourself i mean that's the joseph campbell's hero's journey that's the story of the alchemist right you can go throughout the entire cosmos and and travel far lands to find the treasure Absolutely. but it always resides within yourself but you have to go through that journey you have yes. to go through that that the trials and the tribulations of that just to get back mm -hmm. to yourself, which is pretty fucked up. I don't know. I don't know. You know, when you were saying your quote, there was a, uh, you made me think of, there's one of my favorite Hafiz quotes is uh, something on the lines of, I was looking for a great journey. So I sat still for three days. And I think there's different, right? It's, it's on the same. I think there's different ways to come back to this self. I think sometimes we have to go on a pilgrimage. I, I, whole, I wholeheartedly agree, but I think having two small children, one being three and one being seven, and I reference this a lot, I mm. see I see the authenticity of the soul in my seven-year-old, my daughter, well, she's eight now, I see it slowly seeping out of the balloon. You know, mm. I see her growing up. And it's a, and that's when I say it's fucked up because you are already whole when you're brought into this world, right? You're like my son. I joke with my wife. I'm like, he's pure testosterone. He's not filtered. He's mm. not refined. He's not mm. tainted. He's just a, a, a human. He's a pure human. And I see it in my eight year old as it slowly seeps out the, the acceptance she seeks both in school, from teachers, from her parents, right? And it's and 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 it's natural, right? And it is part of the human journey, but it it it's it's so tainted that you start whole and complete, and then you lose yourself. But then you find you. I mean, hopefully, you find yourself back to yourself. Essentially, well, can I ask you? So, what do you think is what do you? I love that you're seeing that. That's such a sharp and profound observation. What do you think is impacting your daughter? I think I think it's inevitable. I think it's, it's everything. Yeah. I think it's everything. It's it's me. Absolutely. It's my wife. It's her grandparents. It's her cousins. It's her school. Yeah. It's society. It's what she watches. What she consumes. What she eats. Right to the earlier point, her entire her entire existence, everything she does is a part of that seeping out of who she is process again yeah. back even down to the food she eats and consumes and what she does you know for her body you know so it is all part of the process and it's an unlearning by relearning right it's this it's this mm -hmm. um simplicity through being very complex right it's 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 so it's such a duality uh, absolutely and i really i agree with what you're saying and you're making me think about right this is systems theory mm -hmm. the environments in which we live in shape the way shape our ability to stay connected and who we're going to become and that's why how it's right that's also something back to the disconnect to the bigger question 
<clears throat> or topic is the difference between us and indigenous cultures where you live in a village that has to be connected to nature where people are dependent on each other and act on that dependence right so mother's mother together and the men hunt together or the men help each other and families are not that disconnected i mean that was one of let's go back to covid that was one of the big things in covid everybody pretty much ran into their hole and you'd see these videos, or at least I would see. So I'm Israeli, so I would see videos from Italy and from Israel where people are standing on the balcony and they're singing to their neighbors. And there's sure. there's this deep understanding that we don't survive alone. Mm. We survive together. But it's not just surviving. It's we stay connected to our essence together. But listening to you made me think about two things that I want to see if I can... Um, I remember taking this course with uh, very, very, I cannot recommend him enough. Uh, his name is Donald Kelshed. He wrote this amazing book called Trauma and the Soul. And he talks about this story that he heard from one of his patients. She's a therapist herself and she was pregnant and she had a four-year-old daughter. And this is a true story. And when the when she was about to give labor, the daughter was like, when the baby comes back, I want to talk to him alone. Mm. Now, you know, being a child. I know where this is going. <laughs> being a therapist, she was like, well, we don't know. You know, is this like, you know, si like sibling jealousy? What is sure. going to happen? Sure. Okay. She comes back from the hospital. They situate the baby. You know, the girl, the daughter is like, hey, I want to go talk to him to my brother and they were like okay so they had a camera you know like the monitor camera and they're like okay you can go and they go and they look through the monitor just to to really see what's happening and she walks to the to the baby crib and she looks down and she calls him let's say his name was i don't know billy he's like billy billy tell me about god because i almost forgot mm. Every time I tell that story, it gives me... It gives I got me chills. Goosebumps. Exactly. I got chills. Because it's what you're saying. She remembers, but she's it's also going. starting... To, exactly. She's also starting to... Like, I'm starting to lose it. And yeah. he just came from that. Yeah, he just, he just left that world. Exactly. And that's a beautiful... It's a beautiful takeaway because for those people who... You know, I hate to go with, like, fear death right but mm. it's 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 this you know it's this beautiful thing when you really break it down and you think about it, it's like well you, you potentially i don't know but potentially you go back to where we came from i mean i i, I would imagine right Some and would say, yeah. and you may not recall that but you know again back to the sensory deprivation tank they say that's the closest thing that you could be to your mother's womb Mm -hmm. And I've I've had experiences in the sensory depri sensory deprivation tank that um, I mean they were psychedelic to the utmost. I mean the feeling that I had inside that tank, you know, John C. Lilly called it the absolute zero point, which was mm -hmm. where consciousness kind of this ebbs and flows. And I've exp I've experienced, it. and then he says, "There's that's not even it because." you still have the recognition of that space. So there's still the next layer behind that, right? right? And I've experienced that in the tank, no psychedelics, no additional medicines, nothing, just being deprived of my senses. And it's the most peace fulfilling. There's no void. There's no emptiness inside that space. Mm -hmm. No. It's full. You're you're in the mother's the mother's womb, right? The archetype of the mother. I mean, that's the absence, the disconnect we have from that is one of the biggest reasons for addiction. All right. So let's go to uh, for those who probably listen. He's very big now. Gabor Mate sure. is right. Mm -hmm. He talks about the this the the idea that addiction is disconnect from self because of trauma because of society because of our environments and then that fuels in his book he talks about it in the hungry ghost that fuels the right it's a buddhist concept the hungry ghost 
it's this hole that can never be filled, right? The hungry ghost is, they have very small mouths, very long throat, but huge bellies. So no matter what you take in, it takes a long time to get there, but it never fills you. There's a man in Peru called Jacques Mabit, who is now, I think, 35 years. He has a retreat center that's for addiction. And he does Western psychotherapy with ayahuasca treatments. And he wrote this beautiful article. And he says, in a very direct language, he's like, the reason for Western addiction is the loss of the mythopoetic and the soulful. Like, that's it. That is why addiction is happening. He says, this is someone who's 35 years of treating addicts. Now, they have a 70% success rate over five years, which is unheard of in the treat in realms of treatment of addiction. On a good day, in a good treatment facility, you get 10%. We're talking about 70% success rate. Why? Because they work in the realm of soul. They work on what we're talking about. They work with really stitching back, for people back together, the idea of purpose. The idea that there is some other force beyond their pains. That there is something deeper inside themselves that's not just how their trauma defined them, how society defined them. There is something more. The authentic self lies inside all of that. And and the, the part trauma is something that you hear that word get thrown around a lot, right? Oh, yeah. And, you know, in the work that you do and the work I, I plan to do in the future... The trauma of a one person varies and, and it doesn't make one trauma more than the other. You know, I remember when I was a little kid, I would feel guilty about something like something that happened in the world, but like, but I also didn't. Cause I was like, that's not my thing. Like I can't, you know, I like I have a splinter in my foot. And to me right now, that's worse than whatever's going on this side of the world. And People dismiss that very casually. It's like, oh, grow up or, oh, like, you know, especially yeah. as a man, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like boys don't cry and pick up your boots and dust off your pants mm. and get on the horse. And there is, you know, to to what we were speaking on earlier, there is a need and necessity for that at an appropriate time. But when that need of, hey, I have a splinter in my foot is not being addressed to the level of whatever dramatics need to be there is going to be some form of trauma deeply rooted and a yeah. small seed is going to be planted. Yeah. And I, I'm, I blame psychology for that, or I blame old school psychology for that. Old school psychology talks about trauma in two ways. There's, we used to call it big T trauma and small T trauma. Big T trauma, it means you had to be physically or sexually abused in a severe way. You had to go through war. You had to have like a severe accident, a, serious type of loss that would be big trauma and if you had one of those then you had the the permission to have pain right <laughs> you have our authorization that you're allowed Ex to be fucked up. exactly and you right. can hear how this dysfunctional that is right it's like <laughs> and that birthed this idea of right what you just said which is like oh well other people have it worse right i didn't grow up, if you grew up in poverty if you're starving that's big t trauma you're allowed to have that but if you don't, you're complaining. Where's the fine line? Because it is a fine line. We we moved from that. We moved from that. That's thank God we've evolved from that for the most part. I think what didn't involve is that I don't think the general public knows this. Do you it's think that about, there's? Yeah. It's, it's for me. It's it's not about if you have trauma. Everybody has trauma. It's about what size font is your trauma. Is it a size eight? Is it a size forty seven? everybody has trauma we need to normalize this idea now that doesn't mean that we're all screwed up or messed up or our life is it means that we all carry experiences mm. that have left that have made us disconnect i mean that's the theme of our talk until now disconnect from really really essential part of us because of certain really traumatic painful experiences so trauma is both the experience that happened to you and how that experience shaped you. And it can be anything from having really critical parents sure. that deny you love, withdraw love, constantly criticize you and tell me tell you how awful you are, to having big, right, bigger things like growing up in poverty, being abused, you know, God forbid, on a daily basis or something like that. 
everything in between. The moment we start normalizing that, we will move much faster as society to kind of work with that. I wonder if having the diluting, for lack of a better term, of small trauma has a benefit for, you know, again, to the, to the, to the idea that, you know, we'll use boys don't cry or whatever it is. Now, we know that's that's just an old mindset. But does that instill a certain way of being that does have value? Say more. Meaning that, you know, if you're raised in a household that doesn't allow, I wouldn't say doesn't allow, but is is promoting a certain type of, of bravado or a certain type of push to be uh, tougher or stronger or building resilience, I guess, would be the best way to put it, right? It does mm. build a sense of resilience, which has a value in the world outside of a comfy, cozy household or a vacuum of existence. When you are interfacing with the world, right? My my daughter, for example, as much as I see it seeping out of her, it's the inevitable. I cannot yeah. keep her in a bubble forever, right? Yeah. So I do need to build some resi re some resilience within the household where it's Absolutely. still safe, where there's still love, but she has to learn that, yeah, you bumped your knee, yeah, you fell, but you got to get up. Yes, absolutely. And there's new, I, I like what you're saying, Minnie, and there's a nuance there, right? Um, but let's, so let's talk about men for a second. There's a, a great movie documentary called The Mask We Wear. And it starts with um, an interview with, I don't remember his name, but it's a pretty famous NFL coach. And he talks about this very specific memory where he was in the basement with his father and he was crying. And his father said exactly what you're saying. Something on the lines of like, why are you crying? Boys, men don't cry. Like, suck it up. And he talks about how that planted a seed. That it's not about resilience. That for him, the seed was, as a man, if you experience these kind of feelings, you're not a man. And they interview him in the end of the movie. And he talks about how it took him years of therapy to come back to that basement and reclaim that child and tell them, no, no, it's okay to cry. And we move on. Mm. That's resilience. Resilience is not about dissociating from your feelings. And I think that's where a lot of men, I have a very soft spot in my heart for men. I work with a lot of men. And we still have a lot of work to do as men in a collective, especially now where there is so much confusion around masculinity, femininity, how we interact, all this stuff. It's not about dissociating from your feelings. It's about being able to be in your feelings, to feel them, to understand them, to do the alchemy and move on. That's resilience. That's power. That's strength. I'll make it dramatic for you, right? I worked in a methadone clinic. So these are people who went through Things that you only see in movies, truly. I worked with this wonderful man. Wonderful man. He experienced all those big T traumas, pretty much. He was a victim himself of physical and sexual abuse. He actually killed people. He was homeless for years, severe heroin addict. When I met him, he was six years clean. He was living in an apartment. He had a partner. He was doing great. You know what his biggest, this is on the level of masculinity. This man has been through it. This is a man. You know what his biggest fear was? He had a daughter that he left when she was a child. His biggest fear was that one day she will knock on his door without an invitation and he will have to confront her. That was his biggest fear. Because the feelings that would come with that would demolish him. Is this man resilient? Of course he is. No doubt about it. This man can survive everything. But he had to dis dis disconnect from his feeling world to survive. So emotional resilience he does not have. Mm. That's different. There's many types of resilience. I totally agree with you. 
But this is where I think men don't really have been taught something that is so wounding that it made them be basically split in the middle. Don't feel your feelings. That's what's being strong about, right? That's the Andrew Tate movement. Feelings are for, for, for pussies. He even talked about how therapy is, is the cause of depression, which it was like, that's obviously you've, you don't know anything, right? But he's teaching these young boys. He's not teaching them to be men. He's teaching them to be dissociated. So let me ask you, what are your thoughts on someone with an approach more like a Jordan Peterson? And I'm not using him as another Andrew Tate and not using it as, as you know, hot topic. You know what I mean? <laughs> but he has a very similar approach to the idea of, I wouldn't say like it's, it's, it's refined. He's more articulate. He's a, he's a mm -hmm. doctor. He's a psychologist. Yeah. He's yeah. studied. He's, he's, he's well-spoken beyond measure. Yeah. And I've seen him speak absolutely. live and it's like watching an orchestra. It's like watching yeah. jazz music. It is absolutely inspiring and it's, it's breathtaking to watch the man speak. Oh, for sure. But what he's saying to some degree with more refinement has a net message that can be interpreted as the same thing. Exactly. And that's the key point here, I think, is that it can be interpreted for people who don't listen to the nuance. How many how many sound bites and like Instagram clips are there of Jordan Peterson crying? More than he would <laughs> more than you can count. That's what I'm talking about. You can be both. I was in I think the you army. have to be both. Exactly. That's an integrated man. I was in the army. I've been through stuff as that, that was supposed to initiate me into like a certain type of manhood. Mm. Right? I sure. could have just walked with that path and be, but Jordan Peterson for me is, yes, he does have that be a killer, right? There is this, like this really one of his famous things, like be a killer. You need to be a bad man. Like, but don't, don't act out on it, but have that inside of you. Yeah, of course. If you're a man and you want to be a warrior, be a warrior. I don't disagree with everything that Andrew Tate is saying. I just think it's wrapped in toxicity. Some of his messages have a lot of truth in them. Yeah, you should be a warrior, whatever warrior means to you. But don't act out on it. Don't be a warrior to anybody who just says something you disagree with. But Jordan Peterson is a lot more nuanced because Jordan Peterson says, yeah, be a man and you can also cry. You can also grieve. One of his most touching things, he talks about time. And he starts mm. crying and he says, I am so sensitive to the passing of time. And he says, go spend time with your parents. Tell people that you love them. Tell your partner that you love them. Enjoy the moments, those small moments of life. That's integrated for me. That's not dissociating from feeling. That's embracing feeling. That's where he's different. If you're enjoying the podcast, do me a favor. Subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you're getting it. Spread the word, tell a friend, hack the algorithm, and let's get this mamma jamma rolling. Yeah, that's the old expression, rather be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war, right? The old, you know, you need to be, you need to be both those things. And that's, you know, the, the, exactly. the, the book of five rings, it's being a well-rounded samurai or a well-rounded soldier that can, you know, write poetry and journal and cry and laugh and and have all the experiences because that is the integration of the human experience and mm -hmm. bringing that to a soulful level and now expressing it and embodying it in the 3D world that we that we live with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's something that I think as men if for all of the men who are listening to this, I cannot encourage enough. You know, I asked this, um, you probably heard it on the podcast with Michael. I asked him, when is the last time you shared with one of your guy friends how you truly feel? And he gave me, and it's not about Michael. It's the answer that most 95% of men give is that they start stuttering and they say, well, you know, I don't want to burden someone. That's so deep in our... Yeah, think about that sentence epigenetic dna as men that our feelings are a burden to people and what does burden mean it's shame mm. underneath that statement is i am ashamed to tell you how i actually feel because maybe you won't tell me you don't think i'm a man anymore you'll make fun of me and women do that to men too sure 
you know, when people say to me, I say, how you doing? They go, can't complain. My response always is, you can if you have to. I love that. That's wonderful. I always, <laughs> you can if you have to. I'm that. here for you. If you need to, that's go what for we, it. I mean, that's what we can do. We give each other permission. Be yeah. a human. Yeah. Be, be, a, be a human. Be a warrior. Be a this, be a that. But when when we're living, be a human. Yeah. Right. What do you, what do you think what do you think the one of the best ways for people to get back in touch with themselves is? I'm curious your answer. I have mine, but I'm curious for yours. What are yours? My mine is flow. Hmm. Mine is finding flow state in mind, body and spirit. So, expressions of that, whether it be for me it's jujitsu, running, um mm -hmm. time with my family, doing this, having conversations like these, those are all channels and gateways and doorways and pathways to the soul. And when you're able to be omnipresent with yourself, it also allows you to be beyond present with yourself because you're so far past the ego and how you identify in the world that you're just acting out of out of nature, out of essence, out of out of the self. And you're you're able to kind of put down those walls. I love that. Um, well, what you're making me think about is, slow, first of all, you're you're although you may be being active, you're slowing down, right? So you're being more present. When you do yeah. physical rigorous physical activity, you you need to be present. Mm -hmm. right? You need to put one foot in front of the other. You need to like if you're doing martial arts, you need to know where your hand is going, where the other hand is going, where you're moving, right? Your body, your balance, your body weight. Um. So slowing down, um, I like to talk about what I call um, socially acceptable dissociators, um, this being one of them. Yeah. Uh, you can't see this guy, but this is phone. Yeah. Right? Um, there is this really interesting, painful phenomena. If you, when people sit together, the moment there is silence, it takes only a few seconds before someone reaches for their phone. So like, what happened? Why is that? So the other thing is find time, take all those, without that, sit with your partner, put the phones away, close the TV, put music and just look at each other and start talking. I promise you something will happen. But really talk. Don't just talk about like, yeah, start with how was your day, but really ask, your, ask how are you really feeling, right? And by doing that, like what we're doing right now, right, it starts this, it starts a connection. And that connection opens, hopefully opens up to a certain sense of honesty and vulnerability. Um, how to connect with, so there's all these things that you said that I think are wonderful. Um, Is there any practice that you have personally that you, you utilize? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have... Uh, about a 30, 45 minute practice in the morning. Take my dog out, which is also, I do that mindfully. I try to like be, okay, I'm trying to wake up into my legs. I'm like trying to feel it out and trying to be present with her and not like just, okay, how we have to get out of here. Like 30 minutes, I have to go to work. Um, so it's really about presence. And then I have a practice. I have a practice of 15 minutes of yoga. I sit and meditate. And I don't meditate about complex things. The only thing I'm like, okay, I'm trying to be here. Yeah. Like, can I feel my legs? Great. Can I feel my, <laughs> my breath coming in and out? Great. That's what I want. I'm not shooting for the stars anymore. Yeah, I, yeah, I've, yeah. Been to the, I've been to the stars. It's fun. It's great. But I want to start from here. Um, I think a big one for me um, is personal honesty. Be honest with yourself. Ask yourself like three times a day, how am I actually doing? But be honest. Don't have to share it with anyone. You don't have to talk about it. But be honest with yourself. Say like, yeah, you know what? I'm sad. Oh, I'm fucking exhausted. I'm tired of this fucking job today. I'm tired of this. I am feel like I'm not in my purpose. Okay, start there. Because that allows you to start pulling the thread. And that's for me connection. People, there is this thing about psychology that I think we're also trying to fix from the past, which people think it's about um, 
digging into your mother father things and finding all the things that are bad and wrong with your life that is very very uh, again we can there is truth in that because that's freud and freud gave us that that <laughs> that heritage of like the idea is to be a, a how did he say something on the lines of like a madly happy functioning neurotic? You know, who wants to be that? Nobody wants to be a madly <laughs> happy. <laughs> Screw that. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But it's not about that. It's about when you start pulling on those threads, you find yourself. And the more you pull, you start to find the real, the real, real you. The real, real you before, like you said, before we lost, we lost that connection when we were kids because of the food we ate, the, the the environments we were in, the natural progression of disconnect, connect that you described with your daughter so beautifully. But self honest, you know what? Self honesty is like you want to be strong, be honest with yourself. You'll see how much strength that requires. Yeah. Rad radical honesty. And I think also um, extreme accountability and mm. and stepping into to those two, because once you once you have the awareness piece of well, how do I actually feel you now? I think that's where the, the for most people, that's where the, the trouble starts, because now I'm aware of how I actually feel. And now it's really a choice of how I'm going to feel. I could choose to be in this space and remain in the space, or I can go ahead and take action. But in that action takes a lot of discipline and a lot of accountability and a lot of ebbs and ups and downs. So it's easier just to, Keep it going, keep it going, and stay busy, and just be tired all the fucking time. <laughs> yes, well, that's really powerful, right? I'm, I'm totally with you. And what you described for me is the real ego death. Sure, that's the real ego death. The real ego death is not to explode in some, you know, momentary experience. That's great. That's wonderful. But what you're saying for me is the real ego death. It's the real ego disidentification of like, okay, I was this version. Now, now I'm going to like really show my power by becoming that version that I want to become, the version that I need to become, right? It takes but a lot of discipline to change your diet. Yeah. It takes a lot of freaking discipline to start going to the gym. It takes a lot of really of discipline to start being honest with yourself and with other people. It takes a lot of courage to tell people how you actually feel and make those changes and as a, a culture and as a culture we don't promote that and as a culture we also you know you you take the the accountability aspect the discipline aspect and the radical honesty and like i said it, it's easier just to keep it moving i'm just tired and just keep it moving and and just disregard it and you know not step into that that space of accountability and you know, that's where coaches or therapists or psychologists, psychiatrists, shamans, mentors, they all play a role in that because they are, to some degree, holding you, holding space for you to show up in a way. And whatever that way is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's appropriate for that moment. Absolutely. And, you know, that's also something we lost. When you, um, I just talked to this person who she's a therapist and she lived in, this community in portugal i believe where when you when something goes on like someone is fighting with someone or let's say you fall in love with someone you have to say it in front of everybody and then they will start mirroring you be like so let's say this is your first yeah like the fourth time you fall in love in two weeks so they'll be like hey you know you're falling in love quite a lot like what's happening with that mm. Why can't you develop like a relationship with all these like crushes of yours? Now that's on, that's on steroids, right? But I think there is something about, yeah, we lost it because we don't do it with each other, right? This is where actually brotherhood and sisterhood is so necessary for us. I want my brothers who are my friends to be like, hey, you know, you, you, you kind of like, you're being squeaky lately. You know, I call you, you don't call me back. I do this, you don't reply. You do, that's a, that's healthy accountability. If it's done with, with that kind of like commitment to mutual growth and compassion and love. 
I don't feel called out. They're actually inviting me. I love to say to people that I work with, don't call each other out. Invite people in. When you invite someone in... There's a big like, difference. Oh, my, a huge difference. When you call someone out, usually, unless they like have done a lot of work on themselves, their first response would be to shut down because they feel accused or shamed sure. or embarrassed. And then they're going to push back. But if you call someone in, they might actually listen. They'd be like, you know what, Vinny? I think you I think you're right. Well, it's and, pointing and out it, blind spots. Exactly. We all go unconscious. But how loving is that when you do it together to make each other see each other's blind spots so we can all grow and, and develop together? Well, there's also there's also cultural ritualistic lines of demarcation in a person's life that whether it be a baptism or communion or confirmation or certain tribal rituals that allow a person to show up in this world mm -hmm. in a way that now puts them on a, a trajectory that is is healthier and then obviously there's the there's the the manipulation of those things for exorbitant amount of reasons but for the most part those rituals and those rites of passage are done in a in a true uh pure essence that is supposed to put you on a trajectory of you want to call it faith you want to call it god whatever you want to call it it's really a a, a, a rite of passage to the soul yes absolutely but let me ask you this can you name to me those rite of passage that we have in modern in modern time that are not religious yep they're all they have all been tainted by capitalism and by instagram and by keeping up with the joneses and whether it be a sweet 16 or a wedding or whatever it may be they're all they're they've all been hijacked absolutely so, right, there's so not have, one I could think of that's that's purely in 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 just the purity of it. I can't no, think of it. We, lo we lost the sacred. We lost yeah. the connection. Most of it. I don't want to say, but you're absolutely sure. right. Sure. For the most part, we lost the connection to sacred. Getting married today for most people is not about a sacred union. It's about how good is the party going to be. It's supposed to be the happiest day of my life. Yes, but it should be also be the most sacred, like one of the most sacred days of your life that you're actually choosing to union yourself with this person, maybe for, I don't know, anywhere between hopefully 10 and 50 years. And then we're going to leave the divorce rates out for this, from this conversation. Sure. From moment. <laughs> right. But you see, but you're absolutely right. We lost it. And now we're trying to reclaim them. All right, so that's where people go and do uh, men's men's retreats or women's retreats or go to like retreats or yoga retreats or ayahuasca retreats or they try to create brotherhoods here of like initiation, hopefully, right? That's not around sports. Right. right there's this new, <laughs> there is this new, I right. love it, new trend now. And by the way, I'm not against that. If you're hanging out with your, your buddies and what gets you together is Sunday football. But when you're together, you also get a chance to like connect and you actually have real conversations. Bless you. That's right. real. So there's no, it's not about how it looks. It's about what happens inside that container. What happens inside that gathering? And we need those rites of passage. Because like you said, without them, we don't, we don't get to grow to the next level. We don't go to get deeper into who, are, who we are. And... By extension, we don't get to impact the collective. You do, a, you've done, and do a lot of work in. Obviously, we, we spoke about the psychology, we spoke about the spirituality, but also in the psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And you, you touched on a little bit before when you spoke about kind of the psychedelic renaissance that happened in the past and the psychedelic renaissance that we're going through now, and with things like ayahuasca and ketamine and MDMA and psilocybin all making this resurgence that are showing healing properties. What has your experience been like with those medicines and what got you into that kind of lane of psychology? 
Mm. Well, I can say that what got me to it is I've had a lifelong fascination with what I would call now shamanic states, uh, not necessarily with mind expansions. Before I came to California, I had I could cut them on one hand, the amount of psychedelics I took. And I spent time in India, and I've had a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, but like you said, I found there's other ways. I've just found other ways to get into that like next level of, to that spiritual dimension, to that spiritual connection inside and out. And I was like, I don't really need this all the time. This is not. And when I came here, so I had a lot of fascination with shamanism. You know, I read like many Carlos Castaneda and like his, if you read that and all these other, and something about it felt really, it felt like they had the language to experiences I've had. I was a very imaginative kid. I've always known that there was something beyond this 3D reality. I know it sounds cliche, but I always had this sense, you know, like I was a big D and D nerd, and I've always wanted to be a magician <laughs> because I was, I was like, big I into Magic: it. The Gathering. Exactly. There you go. I, I knew it. I felt like I was missing this, uh, this one thing, and. Let me see if this is working. Yeah, okay. So I was just missing this one thing. And when I came here, I got exposed to ayahuasca. And that was very profound for me. Because um, I felt that it really impacted my physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual dimensions. All of them. And when it How was so? time to do my... I mean, obviously, that's a very general, broad question when it comes to ayahuasca. Sure. But, I'll but... give you a very, I have a very, I remember my first experience. I've had the fortune to um, participate in, in a weekend with a very, a very renowned Peruvian shaman who trains many people over the world. And I remember feeling sensations in my body that I've never felt. I remember feeling feelings that I've never felt. I remember having psychological challenges and insights that I've never experienced. I remember being, having a very profound spiritual experience. I can share it. Like one of my experiences was that I was going through a lot of physical discomfort and feeling paranoia and fear and that I'm going to go crazy and I'm going to be a cliche of the, the therapist, the psychologist who gets crazy in a psychedelic and um, which I've learned later had to do a lot with some of my my own systematic upbringing where sure. the idea of psychedelics was a tie to insanity. And when I was kind of able to move through that, I had this image where I was in a room with for those of you who watched the second movie in The Matrix, when Neo meets the architect, has all these TV screens, and he sees all these versions of himself. And I had a very similar image, and I saw all the versions of myself, and I felt an unexpressionable amount of suffering. I can't explain to you how much pain that was. And then I got sucked into this void, maybe something that you experienced in a deprivation tank, this vast emptiness that was the most profound sense of peace I've experienced ever in that space did you feel the way I, I often articulate is that I felt abundance and void dancing Although, with each other exactly it's perfect that I couldn't put it better myself it's although it was void it felt so full and rich that it's it's a it's a non-dual state, right? It's abundance and emptiness, what you're saying. It's non-dual state. And I felt that. And I felt someone supporting me. It's like I felt this hand on my back. And I was propelled in and out of these states for I don't know how long. So when I came out of that, I didn't yet have the words of non-dualism, of like what they call now I know um I forget the name of that state, but uh and now basically a non-dual state. And it was like such a humbling, profound experience for me. So when it was time for me to do my doctoral dissertation, I was like, I am going to study. I wanted to study change. And I was told, okay, you have to choose only one 
You can't study change. You have to use a, <laughs> it's a little broad. I go a little bit, you know, just just at that. Right. And there, I was told I have to choose one phenomenon. And I was like, okay, which phenomena moved my my every dimension of being? Ayahuasca. And I was like, I want to study how people who have profound experiences. Now, I just, it's not about ayahuasca. It's actually how we have, how do you take any profound experience and make it into long-term sustainable change? And I tell people now, it's not about having prof like a blow your mind experience. It can be me talking to Vinny and coming out and you say something to me and it really stays with me. And I'm like, I can't stop thinking about it. And it brings up all these feelings. If I start pulling on that thread, I am going to change. Now, it might be not it might be a 180, but it is going to create change. If I'm going to really start understanding why you touch me so deeply and really start saying, where does that affect me? Why did I feel anger or felt sadness or felt this? And then I'm going to start thinking like, oh, wow, how is that tied to my, my, the way I live my life or have lived my life or my history? Something will happen. I guarantee it. I see it all the time in my work. The trick is to pause and do that. So that's how I got into psychedelics. And then I started, I did that. I studied the integration process through a Jungian lens did a whole bunch of other trainings that had to do with Jung and relational psychoanalysis, started a passion project called the Integration Circle, where we do integration circles for groups, where we do one-on-ones, where we do a lot of education, we do consultation groups for providers, um, and mostly integration. How do we help? We want to help people actually change, not just have, you know, trophy experiences. Where you come back and I've met people and this is not a diss on anyone, but I've met people who had like three, 400 psychedelic experiences that did nothing for them. They had severe addictions. They were miserable. They were lonely. They had a hard time in relationships. And it's not because there's something wrong with them. It's because they did not understand the importance of having a container that helps you take those experiences and slowly translate them to digestible bites where you can then do what you said, accountability. Okay, experience, 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 insight, insight, insight. Now I take accountability. If I was a piece of shit all my life and I treated people poorly, I was rude, I'm aggressive, I'm violent. And I go have a conversation with Vinny, who is now my coach, or I go do a psychedelic experience, MDMA or LSD or whatever. And all of a sudden, I, f I see it. I see the pattern. I see how I was this way because my father was abusive or my mother, or because I grew up in an environment that made me understand that the only way for me to survive is being aggressive connection now how do i take the next step and start repairing that in myself and outside how do i learn to be kind dr <laughs> cohen this was absolutely tremendous Thank uh you. i really really appreciate the conversation um mm -hmm. i i always you know we kind of touch base a little bit and i always just try to walk in these these conversations and uh, I really just appreciate you showing up, sharing sharing the conversation with me, your experiences with me. And uh, this was absolutely tremendous. I really appreciate it. Where can people connect with you? Where can people find more of your work? Awesome. Thank you so much, Vinny. Really, I, it's one of the most enjoyable pods I've ever done, truly. And Thank you. I really appreciate what you're bringing to your people, the groups you're doing, your listeners, really, your perspective. We need more. <laughs> um, you can find me on um, Instagram. It's Dr. Ido Cohen, I D O C O H E N. And for those who are psycho spiritually psychedelic interested, you can find me, find us on the Integration Circle. So it's at T H E Integration Circle, all one word. And thank you. This is this is wonderful. Thank you.